Cromwell Baggins called it a party, but a really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there was even a few from outside the borders. Bill will met the guest, in addition, at the new white gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones, as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion, but it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbit Town and Bywater, every day in a year it was somebody's birthday, so that every Hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week, but they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. The Hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before, and had come all the way from the mountain of Mundale, and were of real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed, and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and, of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times, all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times, there were merely lots of people eating and drinking, continuously, from 11 and to 6.30 when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Grit Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him, and the special effects, set pieces, and flights of rockets were let off by him. But there were also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, backer wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkles, and thunderclaps. They were all supported. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were walkers like a flight of scintillating boards singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. The leaves opened like a whole spring and floating in a moment, and those shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they t- touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles, or sailing ships, or phalanx of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army, and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise, in honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance, and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon. Not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from his jaws, his eyes glared down. There was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed by it like an express train, torn a somersault, and burst over by water with a deafening scream. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hoppers leapt to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone, for everyone that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the ward was not considered proper to use of people, and the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related, with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included, and present by parental permission, the hobbits were easy going with the children in the matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tucks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relations of Bill Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, connections of his took grandfather, and a selection of boluses, boggles, brace girdles, brock houses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfoots. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some of them had hardly ever been in Hobbiton before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The sack-filled Bacchuses were not forgotten. Arthur and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo, but so magnificent was the invitation card, written in goat ink, that they felt it was impossible to refuse. Besides, their cousin, Bilbo, had been specializing in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation. 
All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, although the wife dreaded the after dinner speech of the host and an edible item. He would libel the dragon bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes, after a glass or two, would allude to the absorb of interest in his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had a very pleasant feast. In fact, an engrossing entertainment, rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The portraits of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks. But as Bibble's catering had depleted the stocks of most stores, cellars, and warehouses for miles around, that did not matter much. After the feast, more or less, came the speech. Most of the company were, however, now in a tolerant mood, at that delightful stage which they called filling up the corners. They were sipping their favorite drinks and nibbling at their favorite dainties and their fears were forgotten. They were prepared to listen to anything and to cheer at every full stop. My dear people, began Bilbo, rising in his place. Here, 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 they shouted, and kept on repeating it in chorus, seeming reluctant to follow their own advice. Bibbo left his place and went and stood on a chair under the illuminated tree. The light of the lanterns fell on his beaming face. The golden buttons shone on his embroidered silk waistcoat. They could all see him standing, waving one hand in the air. The other was in his trouser pocket. My dear bagginses and boffins, he began again, and my dear tucks and brandy bucks and chubs and grubs and balls and horn blowers and boggles, brace girdles, good bodies, brock houses and proud foots. Proud feet! shouted an elderly hobbit from the back of the pavilion. His name, of course, was Proudfoot, and well merited. His feet were large, exceptionally furry, and both were on the table. Proudfoots, repeated Bilbo. Also, my good sack filled bagginses, that I welcome back at last to bag in. Today is my one hundred and eleventh birthday. I am eleventy one today. Hooray, hooray, many happy returns, they shouted, and they hammered joyously on the table. Bilbo was doing splendidly. This was the sort of stuff they liked, short and obvious. I hope you are all enjoying yourself as much as I am. Deafening cheers, cries of yes and no. Noises of trumpets and horns, pipes and flutes, and other musical instruments. There were, it has been said, many young hobbits present. Hundreds of musical crackles have been poured. Most of them bore the mock dale on them, which did not convey much to most of the hobbits, but they all agreed they were marvelous crackles. They contained instruments, small but of perfect make and enchanting tunes. Indeed, in one corner, some of the young Turks and Branny Bucks, supposing Uncle Bilbo to have finished, since he had plainly said all that was necessary, now got up an impromptu orchestra and began a merry dance tune. Master Edward Turk and Miss Middle of Branny Buck got on a table and with bells in their hands began to dance the spring ring, a pretty dance but rather vigorous. But Bilbo had not finished. Seizing a horn from the youngster near block by, he blew three loud hoots. The noise subsided. I shall not keep you long, he cried, and cheers from all the assembly. I have called you all together for a purpose. Something in the way that he said this made an impression. There was almost silence, and one or two of the Turks pricked up their ears. Indeed, for three purposes. First of all, to tell you that I am immensely fond of you all, and that eleven one years is too short a time to live amongst such excellent and admirable hobbits. Tremendous outburst of approval. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. This was unexpected and rather difficult. There was some scattered clapping, and most of them were trying to work it out and see if it came to a compliment. Secondly, to celebrate my birthday. Cheers again. I should say our birthday, for it is, of course, also the birthday of my heir and nephew Frodo. He comes of age and into in his inheritance today. Some perfunctory clapping by the elders, some loud shouts of Frodo, Frodo, jolly old Frodo from the juniors. The Sackville Bagnuses scowled and wondered what was meant by coming into his inheritance. Together we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this remarkable total. One gross, if I may use the expression. No cheers. This was ridiculous. Many of his guests, and especially the Sackville Bankers, were insulted, feeling sure they had only been asked to fill up the required number, like goods in the package. One gross indeed. Vulgar expression. It is also, if I may be allowed to refer to ancient history, the anniversary of my wife by burial at Eskaroth in a long lake. Though the fact that it was my birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem so important. The banquet was very splendid, however. Though I had a bad cold at the time, I remember, and could only say, thank you very much. I now repeated more correctly. 
Thank you very much for coming to my little party. Obstinate silence. They all feared that a song or some poetry was imminent, and they were getting bored. Why couldn't he stop talking and let them drink his health? But Bilbo did not seem or recite. He paused for a moment. Thornly and finally, he said, I wish to make an announcement. He spoke this last word so loudly and suddenly that everybody sat up who still could. I regret to announce that, though as I have said, eleven one years is far too short a time to spend among you. This is the end. I am going. I am leaving now. Goodbye. He stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light and the gust all blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. One hundred and forty-four flabbergasted hobbits sat back speechless. Odo Odo Proudfoot removed his feet from the table and stamped. Then there was a dead silence, until suddenly, after several deep breath, every baggins, boffin, took, brandy buck, grub, chub, boars, boggle, brace good brockhouse, goodbody, hornblower, and proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure the gust of shock and annoyance. He's mad, I always sit so, was probably the most popular comment. Even the Turks, with a few exceptions, thought Bilbo's behavior was absurd. For the moment, most of them took it for granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous prank. But old Rory Brandy Buck was not so sure. Neither age nor an enormous dinner had clouded his wits, and he said to his daughter-in-law, us more there is something fishy in this, my dear. I believe that mad Baggins is off again. Silly old four. But why, Roy? He hasn't taken the vittles with him. He called loudly to Frodo to send the wine round again. Frodo was the only one present who had said nothing. For some time he had sat silent beside Bilbo's empty chair and ignored all remarks and questions. He had enjoyed the joke, of course, even though he had been in the know. He had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of the guest. But at the same time, he felt deeply troubled. He realized suddenly that he loved Old Hobbit dearly. Most of the guests went on eating and drinking and discussing Bilbo Baggins' oddities, past and present. But the sack-filled Bagginses had already departed in wrath. Frodo did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders for more wine to be served. Then he got up and drained his own glass silently to the health of Bilbo and slipped out of the pavilion. As for Bilbo Baggins, even while he was making the speech, he had been fingering the golden wing in his pocket his magic wing that he kept secret from so many years. As he stepped down, he slipped it on his finger and was never seen by any hobbit in Hobbiton again. He walked briskly back to his hall and stood for a moment listening with a smile to the din in the pavilion and to the sounds of merrymaking in another part of the field. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped in tissue paper with an embroidered silk waistcoat and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened round his waist a worn leather belt. On it, he hung a short sword and a battered black leather scabbard. From a locked drawer, smelling of mothballs, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious. They were so patched and worthless stained that the original color could hardly be guessed, and might have been dark green. They were rather too large for him. He then went into his study and from an old strong box took out a bundle wrapped in old cloth and a leather bound manuscript and also a large bulky envelope. The book and bundle he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag that was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope he slipped his golden wing and his fine chain and then sealed it and addressed it to Frodo. At first he put it on the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it into his pocket. At that moment the door opened and Gandalf came quickly in. Hello, said Bilbo. I wondered if you were torn up. I am glad to find you visible, replied the whistle, sitting down in the chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to plan. Yes, I do, said Bilbo. Though that flash was surprising, it quite startled me, let alone others. A little addition of your own, I suppose. It was. You have wisely kept that wing secret all these years, and it seemed to me necessary to give your guest something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment. It would spoil my joke. You are an interfering old busybody, laughed Bilbo, but I expect you know best as usual. I do, when I know anything. But I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You have had your joke and alarmed or offended most of your relatives, and given the whole shire something to talk about for nine days, or ninety-nine most likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I fear I need a holiday, a very long holiday, as I have told you before. Probably a permanent holiday. 
I don't expect I should be torn. In fact, I don't mean to, and I've made all arrangements. I am owed Gandalf. I don't look at but I'm beginning to feel in my heart of hearts. Well, absorbed indeed, he snorted. Why, I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean. Like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a change or something. Gandalf looked curiously and closely at him. No, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all, I believe your plan is probably the best. Well, I've made up my mind anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf, mountains, and then find somewhere where I can rest. In peace and quiet, we had a lot of relatives prying around, a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I can finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for it. And he lived happily up or after to the end of his days. Gandalf laughed. I hope he will. But nobody will read the book however it ends. Oh, they may in years to come. Frodo has read some already, as far as it has gone. You keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes, as often as I can spare them. He would come with me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party. But he does not really want to yet. I want to see the wild country again before I die, and the mountains. But he is still in love with the Shire, with woods and fields and little rivers. He ought to be comfortable here. I am leaving everything to him, of course, except a few oddments. I hope he will be happy when he gets used to being on his own. It's time he was his own master now. Everything, said Gandalf. The wing as well? You agree to that, you remember? Well, uh, yes, I suppose so, stammered Bilbo. Where was it? In an envelope, if you must know, said Bilbo impatiently. They on a mantelpiece. Well, no, here it is in my pocket, he hesitated. Isn't that odd now, he said softly to himself. Yet after all, why not? Why should it stay there? Gandalf looked again very hard at Bilbo, and there was a gleam in his eye. I think, Bilbo, he said quietly, I should leave it behind. Don't you want to? Well, yes and no. Now it comes to it, I don't like parting with it at all, I might say. I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to? he asked, and a curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. You are always badgering me about my wing, but you have never bothered me about the other things I got on my journey. No, but I had to badger you, said Gandalf. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic wings are, well, magical, and they are rare and curious. I was professionally interested in your wing, you may say, and I still am. I should like to know where it is, if you go wandering again. Also, I think you have had it quite long enough. You won't need any more, Bilbo, unless I'm quite mistaken. Bilbo flushed and there was angry light in his eyes. His kindly face grew hard. Why not, he cried. And what business is it of yours anyway to know what I do with my own things? It is my own. I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, again, Arthur. There's no need to get angry. If I am, it is your thought, Sir Bilbo. It is mine, I tell you. My own. My precious. Yes, my precious. The whistle's face remained grave and attentive, and only a flicker in his deep eye showed that he was startled and indeed alarmed. It has been called that before, he said, but not by you. But I say it now, and why not? Even if Gollum said the same once, it's not his, now but mine, and I shall keep it, I say. Gandalf stood up. He spoke sternly. You will be a fool if you do, Bilbo, he said. You make that clear with every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it go, and then you can go yourself and be free. I'll do as I choose and go as I please, said Bilbo obstinately. Now, now, my dear hobbits, Gandalf, all your long life we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come, do as you promise, give it up. Well, if you want my ring yourself, say so, cried Bilbo, but you won't get it. I won't give my precious away, I tell you. His hand strayed to the hilt of his small sword. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It will be my turn to get angry soon, he said. If you say that again, I shall. Then you shall see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the hobbit, and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Bilbo backed away to the wall, breathing hard, his hand clutching at his pocket. They stood for a while facing one another, and the air of the room tingled. Gandalf's eyes remained bent on the hobbit. Slowly, his hands relaxed and he began to tremble. I don't know what has come over you, Gandalf, he said. You have never been like this before. What is it all about? It is mine, isn't it? I found it, and Gollum would have killed me if I hadn't cupped it. I'm not a thief, whatever he said. I have never caught you one, Gandalf answered, and I am not one either. I am not trying to rob you, but to help you. I wish you would trust me as you used. He turned away and his shadow passed. He seemed to dwindle again to an old gray man, bent and troubled. Bilbo drew his hand over his eyes. 
I am sorry, he said, but I felt so queer. And yet it would be a relief in a way not to be bothered with it anymore. It has been so growing on my mind lately. Sometimes I have felt it was like an eye looking at me. And I am always wanting to put it on and disappear. Don't you know, or wondering if it is safe and pulling it out to make sure. I tried locking it up, but I found I couldn't rest without it in my pocket. I don't know why, and I don't seem able to make up my mind. Then trust mine, said Gandalf. It is quite made up. Go away and leave it behind. Stop possessing it. Give it a photo, and I will look after him. Bibble stood for a moment tense and undecided. Presently he sighed. All right, he said with an effort, I will. Then he shrugged his shoulders and smiled rather ruefully. After all, that's what this party business was all about, Willie, to give away lots of birthday presents and somehow make it easier to give it away at the same time. It hasn't made it any easier on the end, but it'll be a pity to waste all my preparations. It'll quite spoil the joke. Indeed, it would take away the only point I ever saw in the affair, said Gandalf. Very well, said Bibbo, a ghost of Frodo with all the rest. He drew a deep breath. And now I really must be starting or somebody else would catch me. I said goodbye and I couldn't bear to do it all over again. He picked up his bag and moved to the door. You have still got the weed in your pocket, said the whistle. Well, so I have, cried Bilbo, and my will and all the other documents too. You had better take it and deliver it for me. That would be the safest. No, don't give the wing to me, said Gandalf. Put it on a mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there till Frodo comes. I should wait for him. Bilbo took out the envelope, but just as he was about to set it by the clock, his hand jerked back and the packet fell on the floor. Before he could pick it up again, the whistle stooped and seized it and set it in its place. A spasm of anger passed swiftly over the hopper's face again. Suddenly he gave way to a look of relief and a laugh. Well, that's that, he said, now I'm off. They went out into the hall. Bibble chose his favorite stick from the stand and then he whistled. Three dwarves came out of different rooms where they had been busy. Is everything ready? asked Bibble. Everything packed and labeled? Everything, they answered. Well, let's start then. He stepped out the front door. It was a fine night and the black sky was dotted with stars. He looked up, sniffing the air. What fun! What fun to me off again, off on a road with dwarves. This is what I've really been longing for, for years. Goodbye, he said, looking at his old home and bowing to the door. Goodbye, Gandalf. Goodbye for the present, Bilbo. Take care of yourself. You are old enough and perhaps wise enough. Take care. I don't care. Don't you worry about me. I am as happy now as I have ever been, and that is saying a great deal. But the time has come. I am being swept off my feet at last, he added. And then in a low voice, as if to himself, he sang softly in the dark. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eagle feet until it joins some larger way, where many paths and errands meet, and with or then I cannot say. He paused, silent for a moment. Then, without another word, he turned away from the lights and voices in the fields and tents, and followed by his three companions, went round into his garden and trotted down a long sloping path. He jumped over a low place in the herd at the bottom and took to the meadows, passing into the night like a rustle of wind in the grass. Gandalf remained for a while, staring after him into the darkness. Goodbye, my dear Bilbo, until our next meeting. He said softly and went back indoors.